In order to tune the mind, to listen to the inner voice, you have to keep up with the first step of yoga. To be kind, automatically, you become sensitive to listen to subtle things, to the inner intuition. It comes from the first step of yoga, improving our ethical conduct. That was Sri Dharma Mitra, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Hey, Dharma Talkers. I can hardly believe I'm saying this, but this is it. We've reached episode number 108, the final installment of Dharma Talk. If you're listening to this, whether it's your very first time or you've been along for the entire journey, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. This podcast couldn't exist without you. Now, before we get into this final show, I recognize this is an odd time in the world to be parting ways with you. Things feel uncertain, the future is unknown, and many people are struggling to come to terms with a new normal. So I want to say, even after Dharma Talk is over, I am still going to be here to support you. Come practice with me on the Henry Yoga app, my offering to support the global yoga community. As of this recording, you can still get lifetime access to my 40-day systematic curriculum for just $25 with the promo code HOMEPRACTICE, one word. Sign up at henryyoga.com. And if you'd like to connect in real time, I'm offering donation-based live stream classes as well, which you can register for totally free at live.henrywins.com. See you on the mat soon, I hope. Okay. So we're here, the series finale of Dharma Talk. Wow, it's hard to put words to everything this podcast has meant to me and will continue to mean to me. But isn't that fitting? After asking over 100 teachers, thought leaders, and luminaries I admire to explain what Dharma, one of the richest words in the yogic tradition, means to them, Now I'm in the position of relaying the significance of this whole experience to me. When I think back over my many beautiful conversations on here, I'm flooded with gratitude. And I also recognize some patterns. Over the years, my guests have shared their interpretations of Dharma, both traditional and applied to modern times. And some common themes have surfaced. Alignment with what is natural and true connection to one's deeper purpose, and evolution into the unexpected yet inevitable. And I feel that in hosting this podcast through 108 episodes, I've had my own personal encounter with each of those themes. I've followed my own interest in creating the podcast to begin with and in sourcing guests to pull the threads of my own curiosity. Alignment. I've connected and interacted with teachers I admire, listeners all over the world, and ultimately myself through deep introspection inspired by these conversations. That's connection. And I have attracted an audience, developed my style, honed my interviewing skills, I hope, built a platform, and and now I'm bringing this chapter to a close, evolution. So now I leave you with one final interview. I could think of no more special a guest with which to conclude this series than the living legend who shares this podcast name, Sri Dharma Mitra. The airing of this final episode is a pivotal moment, of course, but so is the recording of the conversation itself. I sat down with Dharma at his center in the Flatiron District of Manhattan on my last day living in New York before I packed my bags and moved off on a nomadic stint that just recently concluded with me settling in LA. And just a few days later, the Dharma Yoga Center moved their entire operation around the corner to their current location. So for many reasons, this feels like a cathartic and conclusive interview to end the series on. Not to mention Dharma's explicit request that I release his interview as episode 108. What a beautiful human being Dharma is. 
at 80 years young, still radiating the joy and playfulness of a child, yet carrying the wisdom of many lifetimes. If you haven't had the chance to meet him or study with him, then I hope this conversation will convey just a little bit of his magic. I can't wait to share this one with you. Don't worry, it's coming right up. First, let me take a minute to share deep gratitude for our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Warrior Bridge NYC. Dharma Talkers, Warrior Bridge can really use your support right now. Like all yoga studios and many other businesses in New York City and nationwide, they have been forced to close their doors due to the current global health crisis. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has not stepped in the way of Warrior Bridge's commitment to service and meeting students of multidisciplinary movement wherever they are. They now have their signature classes available through daily live streams, covering yoga, flexibility, handstands, and even acro, you know, in case you're quarantined with a partner. (laughs) Through the end of April, all classes will be available on a pay-what-you-can donation basis. As an FYI, Warrior Bridge is still hoping to hold their July teacher trainings in anatomy and movement and partner acrobatics, but we'll be watching how the situation develops along with everyone else. Visit warriorbridge.com for all the details. This episode is brought to you in part by Way Team Shop. Have you guys seen the Dharma Talk t-shirts, leggings, and gear for sale on my website? You think I pulled all that together myself? No way. I don't have time to manage an e-commerce platform, let alone design, produce, and fulfill merchandise to fans and supporters of the show. That's all Way Team Shop. At Way Team Shop, quote, it's our dharma to help businesses like yours get what they need in 2020 and beyond. With a team shop, now you, your yoga studio, business, or personal brand have the ability to buy and sell your custom branded gear online and in store. Don't worry about hiring a retail manager or professional designer. Way Team Shop designs your collection, builds your shop, and manages the entire experience for only $99 per month, all with no minimum order quantities or setup fees. You can save hundreds, if not thousands, through Way Team Shop's product and design services compared to the traditional retail routes. And you'll be able to stay focused on your business while they get to work for you. Way Team Shop makes it easy for you to fill your online or brick and mortar retail section with a variety of gear while never running out of sizes again. Everything is available for sale online 24 7. Plus, they'll market and advertise your shop on their website and social media. Best of all, you keep 100% of the profit. I'll let Way Team Shop have the last word here. We are more than a store, we are your team. Get your team shop today. Head to wayteamshop.com and get on your way today. All right, this man really needs no introduction, but here goes. Legendary yoga teacher Sri Dharma Mitra at Dharma Yoga Center on Instagram first encountered yoga as a teenager before meeting his guru in 1964 and beginning his training in earnest. Sri Dharma founded one of the early independent schools of yoga in New York City in 1975 and has taught many tens of thousands the world over in the years since. Sri Dharma is the model and creator of the master yoga chart of 908 postures and the author of Asanas, 608 Yoga Poses, the L-O-A-Y teacher's manual, that's the life of a yogi, and Yoga Wisdom. He has released two DVDs to date, Mahasadhana Levels 1 and 2, and recently captured classes are available for streaming via allomoves.com, yogajournal.com, and Vimeo On Demand. Sri Dharma continues to disseminate the complete traditional science of yoga through daily classes, international workshops, and his Life of a Yogi teacher trainings at the Dharma Yoga New York Center. If this episode speaks to you, and boy, if it doesn't, you better check your pulse. <laughs> then go to dharmatalk.show and type Mitra in the search bar. Because, you know, if you type Dharma, that's not going to filter out much. There you'll find all the notes, highlights with timestamps, and links for this episode. 
And if you're looking for something to read, then I recommend you check out henrywins.com slash books to find my running list of every book ever recommended on Dharma Talk and all of the books written by past guests on Dharma Talk. Okay, that's a lot of ado. But now, without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Sri Dharma Mitra. Hello, Dharma Mitra, Sri Dharma Mitra. So finally, I'm happy to have you on this show, this podcast I've been doing for some time now called Dharma Talk. And for me, it is always a blessing to be really indeed blessed in order to share the way, in order to relieve a little bit of pain and suffering when there is pain and suffering. <laughs> yes, and you do that through all of your yoga classes and you do it through the wisdom that you share, the wisdom of yoga. I always open these conversations with the same first question and I think it's really special to be asking you this question. And the question is, what does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Usually my guru when he gives name to the disciples, means the disciple has a little tendency he should work towards the meaning of his name. Let's say my name is Dharma, means duty, to be obedient, to follow the way, to follow your tendency, to be right, to be strict. At that time when I met my guru, I desired to have these, all these qualities. So I'm still working, improving the Dharma, to be strict, to be almost perfect. So I keep, it is a great meaning. Also there are other meanings, a lot of meaning for Dharma, but the way I know is just to try to be, follow the truth, to be strict, do your best, to follow your tendencies, to follow the inner intuition. <laughs> it's a constant work in progress, even as someone who many people look up to as a yoga master. So it is refreshing to hear you say that it's, it's an ongoing, uh, ongoing practice. And that leads me to my next question, what, which is, what does your personal yoga practice look like these days at 80 years old? And how has the yoga practice supported you on that path toward embodying Dharma? I'm using lots of my energy in order to keep the body in shape, in order to share the way. So I I am concerned about the diet, first of all, to keep the diet correct, to keep my immune system almost fit to share the way. And I do very few poses, lots of stretch, and one of my favor is, how do you call it? Um, I forgot the name. That practice that you move your belly. Uh, Nali Kriya or yeah. Anusara? Yeah, Agnasara. Agnasara, yeah. Yeah, moving the belly mm -hmm. to keep the colons and the intestines in good shape. That I do constantly, at least three rounds of it every day. I do the Kurmasana. And I don't stand much in my head, but I stand now on my forearms. But my favor is head stand. Since I have a little problem with the neck now, you're getting old, but I still put my body upside down on my elbows. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep the cobra pose a little bit and one twist pose. And the breathing occasionally, I do alternate breathing just occasionally, but I do lots of yoga nidra because it is the best way to find answers. 
It is the meditation pose of the spiritual man of the future. Mm. You don't waste your time sleeping. <laughs> you are busy, mindful, finding answers during yoga nidra. Also during yoga nidra, the entire system gets restored to good condition. What kind of answers do you find in yoga nidra? What kind? What kind of answers do you get in yoga nidra? Any answers? I'll give an example. The other uh, two years ago or so, I was wondering what is the cause the notion of time, because I have seen on online, on YouTube, the scientists explain time is so confused. It's, it takes an hour and you still don't understand. And then one day through Yoga Nidra, I just wake up in the morning, you have the answers. The ego. The movables. As soon as you gain your ego, you came to existence, you have a notion of location, and then from there you sense the motion. And that is the cause of time, because you start perceiving the movables passing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> time. So simple. One, two, three. Also, you can find out a very uh, high spiritual answers. Just go relax and listen to the inner intuition. Don't get involved. There are beings that went before us, they know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, listen to the inner intuition. And every time you end a yoga nidra, you may have the answer. Mm -hmm. Finding that voice of intuition can be challenging, especially when the mind is very busy. Do you think that Yoga Nidra is the practice that sets you up to be able to hear the intuition voice, the best practice for that? Of course, in order to tune the mind, to listen to the inner voice, you have to keep up with the first step of yoga. To be kind, automatically, you become sensitive, sensitive to listen to subtle things, to the inner intuition. It comes from the first step of yoga, improving our ethical conduct and mingled with the vegan diet, and then you really become sensitive for the inner intuition. And then you'll be able to see which one is the inner intuition and your personal intuition. They are very close together. Mm -hmm. You gotta watch out. <laughs> there is no I or me doing or anything. It just come by intuition. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you remember a specific moment where it kind of clicked to you that this was an important thing for you to do, to, to take up a vegan diet in order to hone and tune in to your intuition? How did you, how did you realize that that was something important for you to do? During meditation, when you are willing to have the answer during yoga nidra, whatever, sitting, or oh, wow, you are busy during the day, you are busy trying to find answers. And then by inner intuition, I also get the answers. What is the obstacle that's preventing me to get this intuition? Mm -hmm. I quickly sense that is the food. <laughs> you can sense uh, the mind is not clear. Too much maybe dairy or something else, or processed food, cooked food, it blocks. Your mind cannot function in full force. It's like a car 
you have a Mossad Benz, you should have use premium gas. But at this moment, I'm using lard. <laughs> lard. <laughs> <laughs> and as we grow more spiritual, improve more our ethical conduct, we start getting more access, be able to put the premium, mm -hmm. the, the best food that do not involve uh, cruelty or that is pure and clean, that promotes health, light, vegan food, and then automatically we find the cause that's preventing mm -hmm. this answer. Also comes from other reason. Maybe, oh boy, I'm not treating my pets with love. Mm -hmm. that also, for some reason, blocks any wrong conduct, negative, that we are doing consciously or unconsciously, it blocks, it prevents the answers to come. Mm -hmm. All the answers, all the knowledge, all, everything is infinite, is available here, but due to food, or maybe your ethical conduct is not right yet. Yeah. It prevents that. So during this process, we are able to find what is the, the cause, the, the obstacles. Yeah. So everything by intuition, we get the answer to remove this. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. It's, I follow what you're saying, and but it's a bit, it's tricky. It's kind of a catch-22 because if we need to remove the obstacles in, in order to tune in that intuition, and that intuition is what gives us the answer of what the obstacle is, you have to move very incrementally, step by step. Was there, um, can you remember a time where you really struggled, um, whether it was with your spiritual path or your practice, and what did you do to get through that blockage? <clears throat> well, I found one the most difficult to control. I still work on it. Mm -hmm. Food is so difficult because food affects the body and the mind and prevents the body and the mind to function in their full force. Physically, healthily speaking, the material, animal things, the corpus, the cadavers, are no good for us. They have bad negative vibration. And then after four months of eating that, it becomes part of us. That affects the psychic channels, our nerves and that the vibration change there. It also generates diseases. You don't feel good. It increases lower passion. And ethically speaking, you are, we are involving cruelties. Right. So, by participating in anything that is breaking the ethical rules, automatically the vibration interferes with our own vibration side, and that prevents spiritual bliss to flow. When we are in meditation, it doesn't flow properly. You see only darkness because we are not following the ethical rules, the conduct. We are eating animals. That is not civilized. It's not the food of the future. So food was my first obstacle I have to use and follow my guru. He told me that be patient, keep doing your pranayama, and don't be too strict with your food. 
If you feel like eating a mozzarella today, or I eat one today, but under control, in moderation, mm -hmm. and gradually, when the time comes, you'll be able to purify the diet. So, we, we have to keep working and patiently. All these are in coordination to our karmas. Some people are able to control it very fast because they already had some control, control in the past. Some people have problems with food. I have a, a younger brother who practiced yoga with my guru. Mm -hmm. He had no problem with the food. <laughs> Vegan, <laughs> because like he's already had it from the past. He already born with all this, those good qualities, reverent, sticking with the truth, self-controlled. So we have to listen to the Guru, follow his instructions, and be patient. Never expect any results. Mm. Just do it, because it has to be done. If the answer don't come today, it may come at ten lives from now, I don't care, I just keep doing my practice. Never expect results, otherwise you become, your mind become restless, waiting for results. Mm -hmm. But just do it, you feel happy because you are doing it. <laughs> That's a result in and of itself. To be yeah, happy. because I don't know. Maybe I have to have problem with food for the next ten lives. Yeah. I don't care. I just keep doing. <laughs> <laughs> and you still get to have a little mozzarella treat here and there. <laughs> yeah, you just keep doing because it has to be done. There should be no expectation. If you have a little bit of the yam in compassion, and then you feel really happy because you see your body doing. Practicing. Mm -hmm. You're not expecting result, but you see yourself persisting and continuing. You fall down, but you stand up quickly. Mm -hmm. is, that, um, is that an extension of compassion when you give yourself the opportunity to recover from, from falling, standing back up? Do you see <clears throat> compassion as being something that's only directed toward <laughs> others, or is it something that you direct toward yourself? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the feedback, the feelings go here, but with your knowledge and understanding is to, towards everyone, towards all beings, mm -hmm. not only humans, for all beings. And compassion has infinite levels. With a little bit of the knowledge, the self-knowledge, and realizing that we are not the body, not the mind, we are the witness of body and mind. Witness. We sometimes look at ourselves with compassion. Look like your son. You feel compassion for your own self, because you are suffering here, suffering here. <laughs> so you are in it. Mm -hmm. So the compassion is felt here, but deep with understand, it hits all beings, all beings. And you also feel that whatever you're doing here, in some way you're sharing it with all beings. And whatever all beings are doing there, it looks like it's part of you. They're suffering, they're suffering here. You consider, but you don't suffer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll be dead. It's too many. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you just consider all the pain and suffering of others in you. And all that is in you, you feel that is in them. That is one of the uh, facets of self, getting to self-realization, to realize oneself is the same. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that you have to, when you see other people suffering, that if you felt all of their pain and all of their suffering, it would be too much to bear. And yet, sometimes when we practice a lot of yoga and do these practices that open us up psychically, uh, that 
can be what happens. So do you have any advice for those who are having difficulty guarding themselves from the feelings of other people around them and other beings around them? Well, that is extremely simple. By improving our ethical conduct, our vibration change, our emotions, feelings, and beliefs, they reflect the forms of vibration. That forms your psychic ring, your aura. You understand? So, in those things, the aura, the vibration automatically tends to attract the same. Whoever is negative in that, it doesn't go, how to say, is not in coordination with your vibration. They automatically is repelled back. It hits you, but it bounces back. Mm. So your own vibration, your own quality, your own thoughts create your own protection, your aura. It's like a firewall. But at the same time, a yoga has the key to open the firewall. You are able to sense the negative things aside, but you still don't allow them to go up to the head. You can hold it here in the solar plexus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like sometimes people hit me or doing something, I can hold it here, don't let it go to the mind. Yeah. And gradually it dissolves here. <laughs> yeah. But if you let it go here, it enters and then it may mm -hmm. disturb, you may lose your control. It's, it's our wrong vibration qualities that creates the perfect according to your condition, your protection, your firewall. There are yogic practices that you may improve that, like the psychic development. There are three practices, the purifier pranayama, the stimulator pranayama, and the vibrator pranayama, that helps a little bit. But remember, if you don't practice that much, it dims. So the most important permanent is it comes from your wrong qualities. Okay. That is permanent. <laughs> but you should always add a little more. Yeah. In case we are today vulnerable, mm -hmm. yeah, lots of temptations and electronics, YouTubes. And so we have to have a little extra by doing pranayama, meditation. Also, if you do yoga nidra properly, you get everything that you need. Yeah. Also, there's just a lot of people out there in New York City, so... Yeah, yeah they have auras. To a, they've all got auras, and we have auras, but we're exposed to a lot of impressions. So having those practices to, to safeguard you is, yeah. can be very important. I, I love your, your terminology, firewall for it. Um, fits right in with your practice of doing the Anisara to, to build up the solar plexus and, and digest all those energies before they move up to the brain. Up yeah, to the mind. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> you've, you've got a lot of um, kind of signature one-liners, pithy little jokes that you've used over the years. And you've got the whole book of them, of your classic quotes, which I love and, and tend to flip a page open to in the morning if I'm looking for some inspiration. But one of them that really sticks out in my mind, which you actually said in class today, is you have to get your own tricks. All right, many students, according to the age of their soul, their qualities, right? Some people are more ethically evolved, better. They are able to be more intelligent, use intelligence, knowledge, discrimination, they are calmer. Some people are not able to find their own tricks, how to work their joints, if the joints are in the right uh, natural way to bend. They don't have the ability to look at others. They don't have even the ability to copy the teacher demonstrating. I put the thing there on the wall, nobody there even to look. <laughs> they don't have the ability to copy things. Mm -hmm. It's not wrong because they're 
body, mind, just like a computer, they have to use some software to help say to turn on some software there in order to be able to copy, to find tricks. Mm -hmm. For example, how to get your knees flexible here. There are many ways. You have to move your joints, you have to rub some oil there, maybe you have to bend your leg following their natural way. <laughs> you have to copy the teacher, you have to move a little bit, you have to, there are many tricks. Some people, they find their tricks because they are older souls, they have it from before. But um, the inmost touch of all the tricks cannot be imparted by the teacher. You have to gradually learn how to copy the teacher mentally, to mm -hmm. tune your mind with the teacher. And most people cannot tune the mind with the teacher. To feel or to sense how to do a mula bandha, how to concentrate here, what is the meaning of compassion? So some people are not able to tune the mind with the teacher. They, they are not able to tune inside with the inner intuition. You have to give up your ego. Mm -hmm. Those who are more older, I'd say, Let's say those who are doing yoga for a long time, older souls, they are, they are easily, I'd say, have access for the inner thing because they have knowledge, they have respect with the teacher, they are obedient, they look at the teacher, they, they have natural enthusiasm, they have the ability also to see that it is important to master this pose. If you see, if you have this ability that that practice is important, automatically you have what? Enthusiasm. And then automatically you have access to inner intuition because there are beings, whatever, dying to help you, but you have to open and to ask. Mm -hmm. And when those forces see that you are open, automatically it flows naturally, but you have to surrender, to open, remove your eye. In most cases, the teacher has to show the tricks to them. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when I say that, I show them the trick here, nobody's watching me. And when I go there, the person should not even look at me. And then sometimes as I say, then you have to find your own trick. Or you have to look at other students. I myself learn most of the tricks by looking at other students. Let's say a student came here from Satchirananda. Satchirananda told, uh, taught him a special pose. I asked the student to teach me that. Mm -hmm. How to do this pose, how it is, how to breathe. So I learned the trick, how to get here. So yeah. sometimes you look by watching. Did you ever hear about Indra? No. Indra, one of the goddesses. Mm -hmm. She became king of the gods just by watching. That's <laughs> all it takes. <laughs> Pay attention. Tune in. Yeah, just watching. It's like a bird in a tree. All the trees here mating, singing, eating. One bird is just watching all the tricks without doing anything, just watching. You've done so many yoga asanas. You're kind of famous for having the big posters with over a thousand yoga asanas on it. 
what to what degree did you learn those postures and and your practices that you now teach from your guru and to what extent did you learn them from other students well most of my hatha the postures are from outside of my guru mm -hmm. i watch i love ayanga book I, i consider that book There's a Bible. <laughs> It has everything you need. So I copy him. I have a student that was his uh, Iyengar disciple. I learned many poses from Kevin Gardner, <laughs> one of the great teachers. So most of my poses I learned by copying other students, copying the Swami there after my guru and copying all the dis disciples around me. Mm -hmm. They had their tricks. They also are making someone is uh, asana or, or the guru. So I learned lots from outside, mm -hmm. maybe 80% outside. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Because my guru was not too much into the asanas. I see. He was more into the self-knowledge and also food. Mm -hmm. Cook your food here. Your stomach is your pot. <laughs> Be healthy and do a few poses that keep you in shape. Mm -hmm. So in order to make that yoga poses, so I sneak in every guru that was available in those days. Mm -hmm. I bought all their books. <laughs> I went to practice a little bit. Some of them I could not do it. Mm -hmm. So most of my sneaking, copying, was from others that you learn things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you go beyond the physical aspect. You can tune your mind and try and force yourself to feel like others. Yes. You have to copy what they are, what is cooking their heads. <laughs> You're very good at that. And in fact, I wanted to ask you about that. How is it that it always seems like you know exactly what your students and your class are thinking? Even if they don't even say anything to you, you can give them the answer to the question that they haven't even asked yet. Well, sometimes, uh, it's like a habit for many years. When you enter in class, you're just open. And then your eyes, your physical sense almost can spot students that are restless, some are not being obedient, mm -hmm. you understand? <laughs> yes. The other one is in that corner there, not doing anything. The other one is too late. You understand? Mm -hmm. So, by inner intuition, I feel like saying something at the end of the class. So my mind talk a little bit of indirectly about all this that I see people. Some, I can see some students who are, they have a problem. They are sad. They have a, a problem, a portion of thing. Maybe with the family, maybe a terminal problem. And then at the end, uh, I start saying something. By intuition, I keep saying exactly the answer for them. Mm -hmm. And then I have many times stood coming to me. I said, Dom, I was planning to ask a few questions, but you already answered all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you talk a little bit to hate everyone. Yeah. yeah. Just like when you go to read your palm, someone tries to read your thing, they touch many things because they know everybody has one of them. Yeah. Oh, you have a relative just died, right, a few years ago? How did you know? Had. How did you know? <laughs> 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 In the person who are uh, ignorant, my goodness, you're a psychic. <laughs> Not like that. This is a little more deep. Yeah. It's a inner. Look like you're in connection. I'm not doing it purposely. 
but look like it's a natural. I think it comes from a little bit knowing that the self is one. Yeah. Look like it all is open. And then I keep reflecting. Sometimes I don't know what's coming through my mouth. Mm -hmm. Like when I have all these questions, you come here, I'm not prepared, just go quickly. And whatever you ask, it comes by intuition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel Every, that way too. Yeah, everything is opening by intuition. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so, but if you know a little bit, the teacher sometimes learn how to copy body language. You can almost see what's cooking their head, the way they are moving, the way they are acting. <laughs> and then by intuition, look like your computer goes and finds the answer for that. Mm -hmm. They come out through your mouth. You don't know. It just comes naturally. Well, probably part of it also is that everyone's in here, you know, getting in the same rhythm, uh, tapping into the collective consciousness, and then through the yoga practice, we have the key into that firewall that opens it up, and then you can see what other people or feel what other people are experiencing yeah, you, too. You have the key. You got the key. All the software is uh, connected there. Mm -hmm. You close, get the firewall. When you're getting class, you keep the key a little open. Mm -hmm. Just a little open. <laughs> and the computer knows when they go there, so they can take a little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dharma, apart from sharing the wisdom of yoga on in this conversation for the podcast, what are you doing today to live your Dharma? Well, it is almost the same, except one thing, we are dealing with the old age. Mm -hmm. The body become a little weaker, the immune system is a little weaker. We have to spend more energy in the food to keep the body. But the rest, same thing. I keep moving and moving here. I just signed the lease here for another 10 years. By another 10 years, if I find myself this way, I go keep going. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, the only thing, the instrument is yeah. getting, you understand? Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's forearms instead of yeah. head. Yeah, I, I still find my way to stand my body upside down. Yeah. I still stand in my elbows. Mm -hmm. And when I can't stand in my elbows, I'm going to get the boots. <laughs> <laughs> Just shove <laughs> Who <laughs> can move? <laughs> but I shoot. That'll work. That's one way to do it. Yeah, just working. Just uh, you have a little more problem with the body, but all the rest are the same. Mm -hmm. I'm still getting anxious. Every year is like this. Every year you think you reach the end. <laughs> it's not that yet. <laughs> Infinite, subtle. Subtly. Self-realization means what? The end of pain and suffering. But there are infinite things for us ahead of us to expand, mm -hmm. expand. Because God manifestation is infinite. Creation never had the beginning, right? So it's infinite what we have ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So there are everything, I have to say, lots of things to explore, to return. I mean, dying to return here and return. I want to see what's going on here in this planet mm -hmm. 20,000 20, years from now, <laughs> until the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I want to find out what's happening in another blue planet. <laughs> in another one, an old one. Let's go. It's forever. <laughs> But when you reach self-realization, now when you realize that we are the witness, we are one, mm -hmm. there is no more pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. But the ego is your desire to assume all forms. The many of all the asanas is, the asana is to represent, to take all forms of creation that is infinite. And the meaning of life, we have to assume all forms 
We have to do all the provisions. That is to say, we have to assume all forms, from the grossest to the subtlest. And the subtlest never ends. It's infinite subtle. When you realize this, that triggers the, this inner peace. It's not something supernatural, but the constant thing that nobody can remove it from you. Mm-hmm. It goes forever. It almost sounds like as, you know, as your vessel, as your physical form starts to require more you know, specific attention, it's not working the way that it once was when you were younger, that your conception of the self has actually become better, more pronounced and, and more fine-tuned. Do you think that's true? Of course, the ego, the mind is very stubborn. You have the knowledge, you have proof, but it's clear. But as we are getting here, we get more the evidence that the instrument is not, how to say, getting old. Like all things are subject to time. They old, get old, sicken and dies. <laughs> so we are experiencing the process. My guru said, and I have the evidence now, we are dying slowly. Since we born, we are dying mm-hmm. slowly. But now that we are, have the senses and the mind are feeling the discomfort, disappointment, sometimes you get a shinai. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes I go in the bathroom, I sit there. The other day I looked at my car, I was there for 45 minutes. I said, what the? The mind is that against you have to be extremely alert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we start losing having evidence. And then we really having more evidence, realizing more that's it. <laughs> you are convinced that's it. We change the body. We are not this. I don't want this. <laughs> yeah. The you lesson lose your attachment. The lesson you cannot ignore because it's constant. It's your experience of going through life. I think now is the perfect time to move into the final section of the interview. So this is going to be um, a quick section, uh, a quick series of questions. I call it the prana round. So I'm going this to ask. You, I'm going to ask you six fast questions, mm-hmm. and you answer in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. okay. The first one is on the word. <clears throat> one word. Why do you practice yoga? Truth. Truth. <laughs> what is your favorite yoga pose and why? Headstand. Because it is the king of the poses. King of the poses. What is the single best cue or piece of advice that you've ever received from a guru or one of your students? Constant practice is the secret of success. All right. Okay, recommend one book, either modern or ancient, for our listeners. Hmm. The Yoga Sutras. You have to find one that fits your condition. One sutra. Right, because the yoga sutra. Oh, one version. Yoga sutra is made from many people. Right? One translation. The comments are from many people. Some are the levels lower to fit all levels of the students. Mm-hmm. So by inner intuition, someone find the right version A for yoga that. sutra that fits your condition. Okay, the right yoga sutra to fit your condition. Next question is, is yoga for everyone? <clears throat> this is, this yoga is a song. Sometimes you say the practice, right? To practice yoga, mm-hmm. not the yoga in the end. Yeah, the, the state of yoga or the practice of yoga. It's a good, good point. It is for everyone. <laughs> Some 
I'm going to take very long, many lives. Um, so it is for everyone. Is this for one word or one sentence? You can keep going if you want. <laughs> well, the practice is for everyone, including a caveman to the bookland of today. But the essence of yoga is according to their condition, to the age of their soul. And then they get the essence that can only be imparted psychically. But tune your mind with your a higher mind or your teacher. Beautiful. I love those words. Last and question. Like, yeah, like a, a caveman, you give them a what to do? They have to keep going. Many yeah, lifetimes. Don't kill your mother. <laughs> you still have food. No. <laughs> yeah, you just meet them, meet them where they yeah, are. A little touch. Of, <laughs> <laughs> compassion. <laughs> The final question is, how can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you, Sri Dharma Mitra, in your Dharma? By going online, dharmayogacenter.com. There you will find maybe an email address to find questions to contact maybe me. <laughs> maybe someone else. Uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, if you don't like me, there are infinite numbers of teachers. Mm -hmm. I sometimes say to students here, if you don't like anything here, go to Shiva Mukti. Yeah. I'll be very glad that you're happy there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of having you here missing and not following the instructions. <laughs> 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 well, I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to come talk to you today. Uh, I'm moving out of New York tomorrow. This is my last day here. And I you... hope the sound came all right. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think it will. Um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, your teaching has been really important to me in my time here, and I, I really appreciate what you're doing, so thank you. Okay, you all come. I like do it. It was so nice today, right? Sometimes I do something in the computer. Oh, oh, now this is easy. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, travel, but I don't in the United States or outside. Outside of the United States, also doing this kind of work. I do some of this. This is more <laughs> on the side, but I, I go and teach yoga classes. That's good. What you're doing is amazing. It's, it's, you know, it's the highest type of charity. And gradually people get happy, get the answers, they change their life. Dharma Talkers, there you have it. Thank you for this incredible journey. I want you to know that I am sincerely grateful for every single one of you. As my offering to the global yoga community, this entire podcast collection will remain available on all the major platforms for the foreseeable future. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave a rating and review so that others may have a better chance of discovering it and benefiting from it, just as I have and perhaps you have. My sincere gratitude goes out to Rory Wagstaff and Ease of Mind Productions for audio engineering and podcast production momentology for the music all my past guests for their wisdom and all of you listeners for your conscious engagement and support please stay in touch find me on instagram at henry wins join my mailing list at subscribe.henrywins.com share your favorite moments from dharma talk and tag me or just strike up a conversation i remain at your service this is henry winslow signing off of dharma talk now and forever, keep living your dharma.